So welcome to the first webinar in the Emerging Technologies Information Session Series. Uh, my name is Amy Poles. I work for the USGS, where all of my time is dedicated to the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership, or PNAMPS for short, and I'm moderating today's webinar. So the planning of this webinar series was co-led by PNAMP and StreamNet, and it included 13 other people from a variety of organizations, um, so in addition to my coworkers who are helping me with logistics today, I'm also joined by Mitch Muma from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, who's part of the planning group, um, and he inspired the lineup for uh, today's webinar. So we'll get to hear from Mitch in a bit after I go over a few more things. Um, and as much as I like sharing my video, I'm actually going to turn my camera off in the incoming video uh, to help my computer run more slowly, or smoothly rather some feedback so if you just joined the call it'd be great if you could mute yourself all right so i'm going to turn my camera off um all right so uh here's today's agenda um in a minute we'll do a quick icebreaker um and then we'll get to hear from the presenters and we're planning on 30 minute presentations with about five minutes for questions immediately following each presentation and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for additional questions or open discussion. All right, first, uh, um, some quick tips on navigating the meeting platform. Please do mute yourself when you're not speaking. If you're on the phone, you can use star six to mute and unmute yourself. And if you're using your computer for audio, you can mute and unmute yourself using the microphone icon on the toolbar. And you can get that toolbar um, to appear by hovering your mouse over the meeting window, um, then it'll pop up and you are able to click on those icons. If you're having issues or have a question for the organizers, feel free to use the meeting chat, assuming you can get to it. Uh, and uh, you can get to that chat clicking on that conversation bubble on the toolbar. Uh, when we get to the Q&A, uh, if you have a question, you have the option to either type your question into the chat or you can use the toolbar to raise your hand and we'll call on folks to unmute their audio to ask a question. Okay, um, we're gonna put my tips to use. Um, and just for fun, we wanna know a little something about you. Um, we're gonna do a quick poll using Mentimeter. So if you'll all take a second to open up the chat, um, you will find a link to a poll. Uh, and if you would just humor me, uh, it would take about it'll take about 30 seconds to fill out the poll. I'd really appreciate it. And again, to get to the chat, hover your mouse over the meeting window to get the toolbar to show up. Click on the speech bubble icon to open the chat. And my coworker Sam has posted a link to the icebreaker question in the meeting chat. All right, so looks like results are starting to roll in. All right, definitely seeing some answers I expect. <laughs> Cell phone has been a big one for sure, and the internet. All right, computers, drones. Maybe a couple things unexpected on there. All right, this is great. We've got responses. We have 48 responses right now. The toaster, yep, that's a big improvement to my breakfast most mornings. Yeah. All right. All right, well, thanks. Thanks so much for humoring me. It's fun to get to learn a little bit about one another. Um, maybe I'll give it just a few more seconds. Uh, but it's great. It seems like most people are able to get to the live polling, which is good because this is sort of a warm up. We're going to be uh, using this again a little bit later. All right. Well, I think with that, I am going to go ahead and pass the microphone um, 
over to Mitch Muma, and he will introduce the next speaker while Richie is. Uh, go ahead, Richie, if you want to take control and bring your slides up while Mitch is introducing you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mitch Muma with the Bureau of Reclamation and introducing uh, Richie Carmichael with Biomark. And uh, Richie is a senior scientist within the Biomark Supplied Biological Services Division. And he com completed a Master's of Science at the University of Idaho Center for Echohydraulics, a research uh, is focusing on the validation and utilization of bathymetric LIDAR for various aquatic habitat modeling approaches. And he has worked on fish habitat monitoring programs for the last decade, focusing on technology, protocol, and methods development. So, uh, Richie, uh, there you go. Uh, take it away, and uh, let's see what you got. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, hi, everybody. First of all, just want to say thanks for attending. Um, thank you to the PNAMP group for putting this together and, and letting us share some of our work, uh, some of the stuff we've been doing over the last couple summers. Uh, I'm really excited about this opportunity. I want to acknowledge uh, some of my colleagues and co-authors on, or colleagues, not necessarily co-authors, but some folks that have helped work on this project and push this technology forward. Uh, Mike Ackerman, Dr. Kevin C., Braden Lott and Tolly Mackey, who no longer work with us, but still deserve a lot of credit. Um, Dr. Sarah Hoffman, who you'll be hearing from a little later, and Mr. Chris Beasley. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be talking about the Drone Assisted Stream Habitat Protocol, which has really just been our uh, internal effort over the last couple of years to uh, utilize UAS systems to aid in of stream habitat and also utilizing UAS and on the ground sampling and fish mark recapture surveys in abundance to push forward a sort of a capacity-based approach for evaluating uh, streams and watersheds. I can switch. Hey Richie, this is Amy, sorry to interrupt. Do you wanna drag the, um, the team thing either off to a different screen? There you go, thanks. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so just a little bit of background about habitat monitoring in the Pacific Northwest. I'm sure a lot of you are well aware of uh, some of these programs in anadromous waters and salmonid uh, carrying waters across the Columbia Basin. But one of the first ones, one of the earliest ones was the Forest Service sponsored Packfish Infish, also known as PIBO. Uh, it's very well, very well known, widespread, standardized monitoring for riparian and uh, stream habitat, and it's still ongoing. It's been going for many, many years. I believe it started back in the 90s. Someone could correct me if, if I'm wrong. I haven't been uh, involved in that project. Um, but then sort of its predecessor was the Columbia Habitat Monitoring Program. And, and the difference between CHAMP and PIBO is that instead of um, utilizing traditional stick and tape methods for measuring uh, measuring sizes of channel units and things like that, um, CHAMP adopted total stations and some technology to add to what was already being utilized in the PIBO protocol. And many really great products came out of uh, the CHAMP program. So one of the first ones was the NREI model or net rate energy intake, which was a bioenergetics model that was supported by CHAMP generated DEMs and numerical flow modeling. Uh, you have the geomorphic change detection tool, also known as the GCD, which was a way to check to track change within sites um, year to year to see how the elevation had changed and the channel had evolved. Uh, you have additions to the river bathymetry toolkit that were driven by CHAMP. And then the one I'm gonna kind of be focusing on today is the quantile random forest capacity model, also known as uh, the QRF model. My experience with CHAMP, uh, I was involved essentially in the very first year of CHAMP, roughly 10 years ago as a field crew lead and eventually moving into a basin supervisor for the Lemhi watershed and the South Fork Salmon watershed. I've completed hundreds of CHAMP surveys, um, stream, sur stream surveys in general. Uh, and that's actually a picture of me there in the lower left, trying to capture maximum depth in the Csesh River. Uh, and then this is my crew on the right looking for a temperature tidbit. So I've been pretty heavily involved, as Mitch mentioned, the last 10 years in uh, aquatic habitat monitoring protocol development, methods development. So I'm fairly intimate with the CHAMP program and, and sort of its beginnings and endings, so to speak. Um, a lot of the limitations of the CHAMP program are well documented. 
uh, it's labor intensive, equipment intensive. Typically, we would do 120 to 600 meter reaches. The goal was to have a crew of three people complete a survey in a day. The reality was those surveys took longer than a day. We would uh, sample very intensively, oftentimes generating up to 300 unique metrics per site. Um, and then that was usually paired with mark recapture fish data or snorkel survey counts. So that was sort of the, the habitat and the fish component, fish being supported by ISEMP uh, and the habitat being supported by CHAMP. Uh, you also have physical limitations because these were supposed to be surveys in easily weightable streams. Uh, oftentimes, lower down in the watershed was not sampleable. And, and many times we were pushing the boundaries of what you would consider weightable. So the Seasuch River is a great example of that, which is the picture in the bottom right where you have pools in excess of 10 feet deep, um, really steep gradient, extremely large boulders, giant sites. So a lot of times um, these areas were not captured properly because of physical limitations. Uh, further limitations sort of related back to the time intensity it took to sample an individual site. Uh, this is a nice example on the left, a map that I created of the Wenatchee watershed. Uh, we followed a grid space design. So this was a, a spatially balanced, somewhat random sample. Um, and we followed a rotating panel design similar to what PIBO did, except CHAMP was a three-year panel. I believe PIBO is a five-year panel. And so that left us heavily reliant on extrapolation models. If you wanted to expand your inference outside of your measured areas, um, it also resulted in some limitations in how often we could sample sites and sort of the, the spatial scale at which we could sample those sites. And the three photos on the right just illustrate how a channel could evolve over time. So this is just satellite imagery showing the evolution of this particular location in the Lemhi River. Oftentimes we were unable to capture uh, that evolution of the channel just because of our sampling limitations, not only um, spatially, but also temporally. And so there was sort of this need arising to come up with a better method to more rapidly and efficiently sample stream habitat. So looking forward uh, from CHAMP, we started thinking about what were some options for um, sort of improving the efficiency of CHAMP sampling. And some of the first ones were how can we incorporate fisheries information along with the habitat information, similar to how CHAMP and ISAMP had sort of married those two data sets. Uh, we wanted to still be able to utilize legacy data sets because there is so much great status and trend monitoring out there that is standardized and we didn't want to lose the, the power of those data sets. Uh, we wanted to try and create a crosswalk between drones and champ like i said we didn't want to we didn't want to lose that data but we also wanted to be able to leverage technology and then we were more focusing on uh, metrics that we felt were important so uh, fish centric metrics things that were motivated in the literature um, we went through a big analysis to try to reduce redundancy oftentimes metrics were uh, co-related or um, correlated with each other and so we were able to reduce the number of metrics down quite significantly and then we wanted to assess metrics that were important for engineering design and things that were easily communicated back to geomorphologists and engineers that were putting restorations on the ground to help them improve uh, their restoration and better target areas within the watershed or better target specific species and life histories um, that may be limiting within the watershed and then lastly we wanted to come up with a, a more efficient method to support a capacity-based approach for prioritization within the Columbia Basin and within specific watersheds, and then also a capacity-based approach to come up with some type of common currency amongst all of these watersheds or restorations so that you could almost compare apples to apples when assessing restorations. So I saw the writing on the wall back in graduate school in 2016. I knew that um, UASs were becoming more and more readily available and I figured it was time to just go out and purchase a drone and so this was one of the first drone scans that I did in the Lemhi watershed uh, just to sort of figure out whether or not this could be done how easily it was to go fly a drone to produce a ortho rectified image or an ortho, ortho mosaic and then sort of turn that into something something tangible some metrics that were important and so this was sort of my first attempt 
roughly four years ago to come up with a method that could at least look at how different types of channel units or morphological features oriented in space. And so here we've got the main channel, a bar, whoa, a bar, um, side channels, and we're measuring length of the different types of morphological features. You can see a tributary coming in above. So this was sort of the first moment in my career where I realized, yes, we probably can replace some of this labor intensive total station and stick and tape methods measuring the size of units and the size of morphological units with drones. And so this was the first survey I did. It was easily overlaid on NAEP imagery. And so that was another indication that, yeah, this this is a, a viable option moving forward uh, in, in monitoring riparian and riverine systems. Um, and it certainly reduced labor uh, to collect reach and watershed scale habitat data. It's geo-referenced, uh, it's high resolution, and it, it can also uh, leverage photogrammetry techniques to go from 2 to 3D if you want to look at vegetation height and things like that. So a digital elevation model is always available as a product in these types of UAS sampling. So that was sort of the, the beginning of, of a new protocol that we developed. No Stream Habitat Protocol, or DASH, um, and we were leveraging drones to assess the size and the orientations of units, um, and the objective was really to come up with a time and, and cost-effective data collection solution. Um, we really wanted to limit the site-level data extrapolation that was occurring at the CHAMP scale, um, and we wanted to be able to pair multi uh, different scale data sources, so on the ground, drone, and satellite. And we were really trying to um, come up with a framework that can incorporate all of that into what we call a scalable approach. And so you can imagine a scalable approach as going from a channel unit, uh, maybe to a reach to the meso scale, which might be several kilometers to an entire watershed. And these are all important for different uh, aspects of managing and recovering imperiled species like salmon and steelhead. And then we wanted to utilize some of these metrics to help inform prioritization and implementation. And then, of course, the main goal was to support our fish habitat modeling or our quantile random forest capacity model. So as I mentioned, um, not only are we utilizing drones, but we're also still collecting quite a bit of ground information because there are a lot of things like undercuts are a great example. They're important for explaining fish distribution, but they're impossible to measure with a drone. Uh, so we built some of our own data collection software to efficiently collect things that were not um, easily collected via a drone. And then we're able to pair those up. Sorry, I don't know why this is automatically switching on me. Um, we're able to pair those up seamlessly with the drone and the fish data and we're able to scale it um, up or down for increased detail at necessary sites, for example, uh, at a restoration or pre and post restoration monitoring. So again, we're, we're incorporating not only drone data, but we're hoping to incorpor incorporate satellite derived metrics as well. Um, that would help give us a snapshot into what the watershed might look like as opposed to an individual channel unit, but then we can scale that up and down based on the different types of data intensity that we're collecting throughout the watershed. Um, it's a really nice cost effective approach and it is a long term status and trend monitoring, especially when you have these long term like CHAMP data sets or PIBO that we're still able to incorporate and crosswalk with the DASH data. Um, and then if you incorporate satellite information, it becomes almost continuous in near real time. So it's, an, it's a nice approach to look at how the channels are evolving and how the habitat's changing over time. Um, and it's, it's near real time if you can leverage satellite information. So really, as I mentioned before, you know, the most important piece of all of this was trying to feed into our uh, QRF model. So we were really hoping to come up with an approach to leverage drones more efficiently to um, to feed into our fish habitat modeling. And so just a, a quick background about our QRF model. And we actually just got word today that this is going to be published in Ecosphere after a round of um, revisions. So we're really excited about that. Essentially what it is, is it's a machine learning model that has an input, which is habitat information and an output, which is um, fish carrying capacity in a sense, but it's really more abundance. And so um, some of the advantages to the QRF model are 
Uh, its ability to capture and characterize nonlinear relationships between abundance and the habitat covariates. Um, it can incorporate habitat correlations, and so that's what allowed us to reduce our number of metrics that we're utilizing quite significantly because oftentimes the habitat metrics are very highly correlated. Um, it's easily adaptable to a lot of different habitat metrics as long as you have the associated fish information. So that's how we're able to utilize not only legacy CHAMP data sets, but also the newly generated DASH metrics and uh, remotely sensed metrics that come from satellites. Um, and the way we go from basically a predicted mean density, essentially, to what we're calling capacity, is you can imagine that you can make a thousand predictions at every site that has habitat and fish information. You're training the random forest model to then spit out all these predictions where you get a distribution of pre predicted fish density. And then we're assuming that somewhere near the tail or the higher end of that um, distribution, we're calling capacity. And so in this case, we're calling it the 90th quantile is capacity for the habitat at that given location based on those habitat covariates. And um, this model was trained on roughly 300 paired fish habitat sites leveraging CHAMP and ISAMP data. And it was developed for a multitude of species. So currently we're evaluating steelhead and Chinook, and we're also doing it at multiple life stages. So we're evaluating carrying capacity for spawners, um, juvenile summer rearing and uh, some, and excuse me, winter rearing as well. So there's three life histories that we're evaluating across essentially the entire upper salmon. And it's just a really nice approach to work in sort of a common currency um, to compare across multiple watersheds where you might be seeing some of these capacity deficits. And so this is a nice example of how this approach is scalable. Uh, I referred to that earlier. And so what you have on the left is a drone scan and then the um, resulting QRF capacity prediction. In this case, it's Chinook par per meter. It should be per meter squared, actually, I think. But anyways, you can drill down into the individual channel unit and start to see what the carrying capacity is at each channel unit and maybe how the habitat might be driving that capacity. You can then scale it up to the middle image, which is actually a five kilometer reach in the Lemhi watershed and start to look at how the capacity changes through a meso scale or a site scale. And this is really relevant to evaluating restoration because now we're seeing a lot of these really large restorations, multi-year projects being put in place. And this is a nice way to efficiently evaluate the habitat uplift that might be occurring based on the change in capacity uh, driven by the change in some of these specific habitat metrics that we're evaluating in the DASH protocol. And then we can leverage satellite derived information to extrapolate that capacity prediction across the entire watershed to get an entire watershed prediction of, of capacity. And that's what you see in the image on the right. And this is, um, I believe, a Wenatchee watershed. Uh, so we've expanded this quite a bit to the majority of the Columbia as sort of a first cut. Um, but we're leveraging, you know, ground data, drone information, and satellite information to sort of come up with a scalable approach that is relevant for a bunch of different people working in these watersheds. So as I mentioned, it's a really nice way to try and evaluate habitat uplift. Uh, historically, it could take decades to realize um, you know the success of a restoration because of of other factors like ocean conditions or downstream survival or hydropower survival so you don't ever really realize the habitat potential or the uplift from a from a watershed or from a restoration and this is a nice approach to get a near real-time capacity uplift and sort of moving the bar closer to recovery and so it's a really nice way to uh, evaluate pre and post restoration and that's sort of these two example images we're showing here um, but the scalable approach is also a really nice way to prioritize quantitatively uh, some of the limiting factors within watersheds and what types of restorations you might want to put on the ground and where you might want to put these restorations um, and it also helps inform restoration design because we're able to tease out some of these correlations between 
fish in their habitat and how those fish might be interacting with their habitat and what specifically about the habitat might be limiting or what specifically about a given reach might be really good in driving carrying capacity. So we're able to communicate those results with engineers and geomorphs putting these restorations on the ground. So initially we were utilizing a um, RGB camera, a traditional red green blue camera on a Phantom 4, but to sort of have some more value added to those images, we moved towards a six band uh, Micasense Altum, which is a multispectral camera and it and it takes RGB imagery, but it also takes uh, near infrared and red edge and long wave infrared thermal. Um, and so it allows you to do some automated evaluations of riparian health and riparian condition, but it also helps in the post processing of the images. So it really increases the differentiation between like water and vegetation and bare earth. And so you can see that in the image on the right, the thermal band really picks up on the channel really nicely. Uh, oftentimes these sites that we're flying, you can't see the channel at all in the RGB imagery, but you can still see these little blotches of cold water in the thermal. And so that still helps us um, figure out where the channel is and it helps us cut up into channel units um, to still get that channel unit distribution from the aiding of the ground surveys. And so trying to come up with a way to process this imagery efficiently, uh, this was sort of my first cut, writing some code that could basically automatically classify what was being seen in the image. And this is just sort of your standard uh, supervised random forest pixel based classifier. It was one of the first ones I wrote several years ago, and we were just trying to see if we could automatically pull out uh, common land cover classes like water, vegetation, bare earth, and woody debris was a really big one. Um, and Sarah's going to talk a little bit about more we've more where we've gone with this uh, automated processing, but this is just an example to show that um, we we are able to automatically classify some of these different land cover types, but we're really hoping to move towards more of a object-based classification and deep learning model and sort of away from these supervised pixel-based classification schemes. So not only does this type of approach uh, lends itself well to these, these scalable um, things that are important for, for recovery of these species, but it, it provides a really nice way to communicate uh, what the habitat looks like. And so it's a qualitative and kind of a quantitative approach where you can overlay uh, these results on high resolution drone imagery and it provides context. It's, it's a detailed assessment, so to speak, of where good and poor habitat is. Um, it's just high quality data products and, and it really helps relate back to a, a huge variety of stakeholders that are involved in, in monitoring and recovering in the Columbia Basin. And one thing I really like about it is, again, this sort of qualitative approach where you're able to almost visit a site without ever actually going to visit a site. And so I like to show this video. This is a three dimensional rendering that I created strictly from 2D drone imagery. Um, this is a habitat restoration that's an engineered log jam in Little Springs Creek and will fly over a Biomark pit tag detection system in the stream there and so it's just a really nice way to sort of track restoration progress qualitatively and also sort of communicate how the restoration is evolving over time to groups who might be involved or interested in the restoration and so it not only you know do drones and, and does this type of approach provide the quantitative um, aspects necessary for the fish habitat modeling but it also provides that qualitative piece too just to easily communicate with folks and given the current COVID climate, I don't know when we're all going to be traveling again. So it's just sort of value added in that sense that you can easily go from flying a drone, collecting images to creating some type of interactive, whether it be web based or video, um, in this case, just a video fly through of this 3D mesh. But it's just a really nice way uh, to to help communicate those types of aspects to groups and, and to folks interested. Uh, another really important aspect of, of standard imagery is data permanence. 
So with Pybo and Champ, certainly you have a lot of metrics that are generated, um, but those measurements are very static in the sense that it's going to be difficult to go back in there and get any more value from those measurements. Whereas with imagery, as we're continuing improving our machine learning techniques, that imagery is always going to be available to that machine. And so it's just this idea that by collecting standardized imagery, you're also providing a permanent data source to go back and mine year after year as the machine gets smarter and smarter. And that's kind of the idea behind data permanence. Um, and depending on the different project goals, obviously that's going to sort of determine how you're going to be analyzing that imagery. Um, obviously, it's a very durable source of information and it provides sort of this backbone for long term status and trend monitoring. And it's always stored with geolocation data. So it's very easy, easily transferable amongst groups and amongst pr practitioners. So some of the current shortcomings that we've began to address, but we're still sort of struggling through, one of the first ones being image processing. Uh, computationally limited in that sense, uh, image processing, whether you're uh, mosaicing images or going from 2 to 3D processing large data sets. Oftentimes we're working in terabytes of data depending on which watershed we're in. So that leads into also storage. Uh, reading and writing this much data can be very difficult. And so those two processing and storage need to be married somewhere together. Um, and right now we're working in cloud-based solutions, which seems like it's going to be a really nice avenue, specifically ABS right now. Um, but, but before we were working on external hard drives. And so it's been really cool to see cloud computing evolve over time. And it just seems like a nice marriage between this type of approach in cloud computing for processing and storage and also reading and writing the data. Um, obviously you have physical habitat limitations. So if you can't see the channel, it's gonna be very difficult to sample it with a drone. And so that's sort of why we've come up with this approach where we're marrying on the ground and drone data and so we're able to apply it to a variety of different habitat conditions and, and we haven't really come across a situation where we haven't been able to uh, measure the required data to feed into our QRF model or to provide um, status and trend monitoring of a given habitat. Um, the other issue is just metric generation so going from processing imagery into an ortho mosaic to actually turning it into metrics that are important and relevant uh, for these different goals and different projects. And so that's something we've been working on with some of our different machine learning techniques and also some of our data pipelines that we're building in R um, and data in the, in the processing vignettes that we're coming up with to sort of merge all of the drone, satellite, uh, on the ground and fish data into sort of a seamless, seamless pipeline and a seamless product and metrics. And then the last one would be validation. I think that over the last decade, we've seen a ton of literature about uh, LIDAR validation, LIDAR utilization, bathymetric LIDAR validation, bathymetric um, LIDAR utilization. And so I think it's only a matter of time before we start seeing a lot more uh, studies coming out about the utilization and validation of drone imagery. But still, it, it seems like it's somewhat in its infancy when you compare it to other remote sensing techniques. Um, so for us and, and maybe, oh, sorry, I say, say you have a few yeah. minutes to wrap up. OK, I think this is my last one. Time flies, sorry. <laughs> um, so for us, the next steps are going to be um, really coming up with some imagery standards. So the first would be since obviously your ground sampling distance determines your resolution. Uh, so that's your ortho mosaic resolution coming up with some metadata standards. Um, processing uncertainty and error in the actual final products. Uh, what type of equipment folks should be utilizing or what type of equipment do we want to utilize? And then obviously the validation portion of that. Um, and I like to use open topography and USGS's uh, portals, data portals as nice examples, but we, we need some type of centralized image repository for drone, drone data, whether it be storage and processing uh, we also need to standardize metric generation and then we need to come up with some processing tools that are widely available for everyone for everyone to utilize and then some type of data sharing platform across the columbia basin um, because i know you know for example in the lemhi you have several groups flying 
drones oftentimes flying in the same location and that data is not being shared seamlessly amongst groups. Uh, we need to improve image processing, so leverage emerging deep learning models, decide whether we want to go with a high-res RGB or multi-spectral camera, um, further develop our data pipeline, come up with a basin-wide strategy and basin-wide buy-in for sort of this uh, remotely sensed plus on the ground driven capacity based approach. And then we obviously need to maintain uh, the legacy data utilization. And just in review, um, the DASH protocol, but not necessarily the DASH protocol, I think remote sensing drones, LIDAR in general, satellite derived metrics, uh, reduce data collection efforts. They're scalable and they're cost efficient. Um, and they're permanent and they're oftentimes standardized. So they're removing the human element from a lot of these types of uh, status and trend monitoring. And with that, I will open it for questions if I have time and if not, I'll punt it to Sarah. No, we definitely we have time for some questions. Um, so just a quick reminder, you can either type your questions into the chat um, or you can raise your hand using the toolbar and we'll call on you to unmute yourself. Are there any questions for Richie? All right, it looks like uh, Casey Justice has a question. Go ahead, Casey. And you have to unmute yourself. I can't unmute you. And to unmute yourself, you need to bring your toolbar up on your meeting window. There you go. Wow. I clicked unmute about 10 times. It finally worked. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. OK. Hey, thanks a lot for that excellent presentation. That was really great. Uh, one question I have is um, landowner issues. Have you guys encountered um, a lot of landowners? Yeah, um, you know, we've been really fortunate in the Lemhi specifically that a lot of the landowners are open to letting us um, fly drones on their property, but we definitely have had a bit of a tough time working with certain groups uh, and certain landowners. It's just, I think, as as this becomes more common, I think sort of that fear of drones will start to subside. But yeah, it's definitely a consideration for sure. Um, but we've been fortunate enough to be able to uh, to still push a lot of the drone sampling forward. All right. Um, thanks uh, for that question and answer. And let's see, we've got Matt Schwartz. Do you want to unmute yourself? Hi. Um, thanks. That was a great presentation. Um, I just starting. So at one point you showed, you know, that five kilometer stretch that you sort of um, put together with the drone. What What is sort of the difference in time versus just doing that on the ground versus on the ground with the drone? Yeah, that's a good question. I get that one pretty often. I, I guess the long answer is that it just depends on what metrics you're hoping to collect. The short answer is that specific site, um, you know, if I were to compare it to a CHAMP survey, I don't know that it would have even been sampleable just because Although it was five kilometers of river, it was really more like 15 kilometers of total wetted channel. Um, the drone sampling took a couple hours. The processing probably took a couple more hours. And so, um, you know, it's a huge time savings in that sense. It just really de depends on what metrics and what the goal of your sampling is going to be, though, because um, that determines how intensive you're going to be sampling. Great. Um, and now a question from the chat. Uh, is there somewhere we can go to learn to be able to integrate some of these methods into our own work or any software available for it? Um, currently, we don't have. So right now we're working on a data pipeline and a vignette to sort of explain how we're incorporating all this information. Um, but one software I like to use just for processing drone, da drone data is called Agisoft Metashape. There's a whole bunch of them out there that people are using. Drone Deploy, 
Um, there's a whole bunch of them, but Metashape's a really nice choice. Uh, if you had specific questions about how to do it, you can always reach out to me or Mike or Kevin or Sarah, and we could definitely help you out. Um, but right now we're just sort of working through coming up with a nice uh, bottled you know, approach that we could roll out to other agencies. Um, and kind of along those lines, somebody was asking for your contact information. So are you okay? You're okay with us sharing that um, once we, you know, get yeah. the recording process done out there? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. I, I mean, I think, yeah, just to add to that, um, for me and for us, like, this is really just a way of sharing information. I, I've, I've been in talks with other groups doing similar work, and I think it's just super important that we're all you know, sharing this type of information because the technology and the processing is evolving really quickly. And so I'm always happy to um, share information and talk with folks uh, that are interested. Okay, last question from the chat, um, and then we'll move on, but I think we've got time for one more. Uh, the question is, are there any examples of using the QRF model to inform restoration design in an adaptive management framework? Sorry, can you repeat that one? Sure. Are there any examples of using the QRF model to inform restoration design in an adaptive management framework? Yeah, there is actually. Um, I would point directly to the integrated rehabilitation assessment, which would be the first document worth checking out, which is where we used the QRF model in the upper salmon at a watershed scale to come up with um, all of these different capacity limitations for different life histories and different life stages. And we've since moved into the MRA, which is the multiple reach assessment, where we're now uh, writing sort of these watershed uh, specific approaches to restoration. Um, and then we're evaluating restoration with the QRF model to uh, communicate sort of the fish habitat relationships back to the practitioners. Um, and so that's the integrated rehabilitation assessment and the multiple rehabilitation assessment which are joint projects between our group, uh, the group at Rio ASE, the BOR, and the State of Idaho Office of Species Conservation. All right, thank you so much, Richie. Um, I'm sorry if you didn't get a chance to answer your question um, or to ask your question. Uh, if you just wanna hold on to that, um, we are gonna have an open Q&A at the end. So there will be another opportunity to ask Richie some additional questions at that point. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna pass the microphone back to Mitch and Sarah, if you wanna take control of the presenter role. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Hoffman. Uh, Sarah is a scientist with the Applied Biological Services Division of Myomark and whose work lies primarily in identifying developing emerging technologies for the study of animals. She did her master's and PhD at Florida Atlantic University on marine phys physiology and biomechanics, where she adapted a technique for underwater motion capture to quantify the kinematics of free swimming sharks. So Sarah, uh, given that, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Mitch. Um, I appreciate it. And again, thanks so much for having us today. Rich and I were both really excited to talk to this group about some of the work that we're doing and then also hopefully get some feedback um, if people have ideas about how we can move forward. So um, following Richie's presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we do with the imagery once we have it and how we can turn that into actionable um, metrics to move forward in conservation. Um, and like him, I have a series of co-authors that I'd like to acknowledge. Um, Richie did a lot of this work along with our machine learning engineer, Steve Garono. Um, Kevin C. and Mike Ackerman were instrumental in the development of the concept. Um, and then our fearless leader, Chris Beasley, has been at the heart of this work as well. So um, I want to first start with just a brief introduction of where drones came from and how they've infiltrated the conservation sciences. And the first history or the first acknowledgement of a drone is actually in 1906 when a photographer uh, strapped a 49 pound camera to 17 kites in order to image San Francisco after the devastating earthquake. Um, interestingly, the advent of drones 
um, in this context was because he originally tried to fly himself into the air to take these images and fell about 200 feet and managed to survive. But that was really what prompted the idea of throwing cameras in the air without throwing our own bodies in the air. Then we see the um, first commercial license for drones in around 2006. Um, at this time, permits were still pretty hard to get. So the majority of drone use was for things like pesticide spraying or pipeline inspection, um, things that were deemed dangerous or hard to access for human labor. By 2013, we see the first commercially available, available DJI Phantom. Um, this was what we think of as kind of your standard Phantom with um, a really old GoPro Hero 2 strapped to it and it only had about 10 minutes of battery life. So then by today, um, we see everything from these highly specialized miniature drones to amphibious drones to um, hybridized fixed winged and quad copter, copter drones, pretty much anything that you think that we could put on a drone, we can these days. So um, they've come a long way both in development as well as in commercialization. And all of that really stems from this inherent value that is imagery. And imagery has been used in conservation for a long time. So um, before drones and remote sensing were widely available, um, there were helicopter and um, airplane flights to conduct surveys. Um, in this example, this is actually active protection against poaching. Um, but these flights were really expensive and also really dangerous. So um, despite the value that they gave, there was inher an inherent risk and cost associated with that sampling technique. And then came um, the broad adoption of remote sensing in um, conservation. As Richie kind of talked about, this is more valuable for perhaps um, broad scale habitat sampling, but it did offer a more cost-effective way to um, get broad-scale imagery. However, you are um, sacrificing on the resolution of the imagery as well as the time frame at which you can resample. And so that's really where drones have come into the picture. You're able to cost-effectively and safely sample these remote or hard-to-reach areas um, across broad swaths of habitat and you can do it in near real time. So it's a great, it takes the best of these two worlds um, and packages it into a relatively cost efficient option. And the ability to sample at these, you know, relatively rapid succession gives us a nice understanding of how things change in faster times. So for example, this is an ortho mosaic of the St. Joseph Atoll in the seashells. Um, and this was a study done looking at habitat use by elasmobranchs um, in the atoll. And you can see on the left how much available ha the habitat there is at high tide and where all of that water has since pushed out at low tide. Um, so this gives us, first of all, these beautiful, um, highly engaging products to um, present to your stakeholders and it provides a real time um, estimate of what habitat is available to these animals. So for these reasons, drones have started to become more broadly adopted in conservation. And some examples, like Richie was just talking about, a big one would be habitat monitoring. So um, these are photos that are flown um, in rapid succession. So I think this was in the time span of a month looking at deforestation in Sumatra. Um, again, we see that type of imagery being useful here in the Columbia River Basin as well. Um, another example of added utility in, uh, in this case, multi-spec imaging would be the ability to evaluate something like the vegetative health of an area. We also see drones used for species or nest distribution monitoring. So for example, red surveys that are flown with drones um, or even something on a broader scale, like mass migrations of um, ungulates um, across their wide-scale migratory patterns. 
maybe a more specific example also is that we're able to capture animal behavior that we historically haven't been able to see. So in this example, um, drones have been used to identify the predatory behavior of hammerheads on black tip sharks in South Florida. And again, unless you were lucky and on a boat, the ability to pull out these data um, with without observer bias was really limited um, before we had this high resolution drone data. And so understanding that drones are useful and we know that they produce these high quality results, there are still quite a few barriers for them to be widely adopted in management programs. And I think one of the biggest issues that we see or we hear talked about is just the mass amount of data that you get from a drone. And Richie alluded to this quite a bit as well. So we're working in terabytes of data. Um, maybe you've flown a site and you have thousands of images. First, you have to get those images into some sort of ortho rectification. So making sure you can make accurate ground measurements from the imagery. And then if you want a full site, you have to tile them together. So that can often require expensive software. And then if you want to rely on metrics that we have used historically, you have to build some sort of a bridge from the metrics that you can derive from the drone imagery to the metrics that have historically been used to describe salmon um, abundance or animal abundance, whatever you're working with. And then you also have to think about how those metrics that you are deriving from the drone actually relate to the animal itself. And then considering all of that, you have to think about um, how those metrics lead to actionable um, steps. So for in this case, um, what do we know about this site? What, how did we pull out this site from drone data? And how did we then design this specific restoration scenario? So the, the big barriers are really figuring out how to get useful data, well, get your raw data into a useful state and then pull um, actionable metrics out of those data as well. And while we have a general understanding that we can sit here and measure polygons around all of these wood pieces, and yeah, that would be probably faster and cheaper than sending a crew out to go measure every piece of wood, that's still quite a bit of work, especially if you have kilometers of sites to go through. So this is really where we start to see machine learning um, play a role in image processing. And before we go into that, I want to go through a brief history of machine learning and how it came to arise in conservation as well. And this really starts in the 1940s with Alan Turing, who is the first person to um, question whether computers could learn from their history. Um, so this machine learning really came to rise, or this computer intelligence with his work in 1947. And then by the 1950s, um, Arthur Samuels actually coined the term machine learning, and he built this computer that um, was an algorithm to play checkers against. Um, and then by 1957, we see um, Frank Rosenblatt, who combined um, Samuels' machine learning work with um, on the checkers algorithm with a conceptual model of the brain cell interaction. And he built this crazy machine, which is called the Mark I Perceptron. And it was the first uh, physical machine constructed for image recognition. And this was really the birth of our modern understanding of neural nets. And you can almost kind of visually see that with this giant network um, of, of of wires happening. And so then um, a lot of development occurred in the 60s and 70s. There was a lot of work on figuring out how to add in multiple layers, uh, back propagation developed, so algorithms moving in both directions. Um, and then there was eventually, by the 1990s, some more widely available algorithms um, that could be used in a commercial setting. So 1998 is the first publication that I can find um, with any type of machine learning used in the context of conservation. So in this instance, um, the authors were able to identify individual tigers based on the morphometrics within their prints themselves. And this was 
Um, the algorithm was called AutoClass. It's actually still used today. Um, it occurs within a Bayesian framework, and it was really sort of the birth of machine learning in conservation work. By 2006, uh, we see the birth of facial recognition software. So the face recognition grand challenge occurred. And this is what really modernized machine learning in, to the point where we see how ubiquitous it is in today's society. And then by 2014, we start to see really advanced machine learning applications such as deep fakes. Um, this is a really interesting application as well. So this is the first ever portrait that was created by a machine learning algorithm. Um, and this is actually a whole new branch of the art world. And believe it or not, these portraits go for about half a million dollars. So somebody figured out something there. All right, so um, the bigger question is, how can machine learning be a solution for conservation? And um, perhaps one of the most broadly adopted answers that we see in the literature today is that machine learning does really well with complex and nonlinear data. So these are some partial dependence plots from the QRF models that Richie was talking about. And you can see that most of the relationships between fish and certain habitat metrics are nonlinear. Also, um, a big part of these um, Covariates are correlated with one another, which can also throw a wrench into statistical analyses. So these are things that machine learning does really well. It can also incorporate large, messy data sets um, and account for differences year to year or site to site. Um, and it's able to handle those a little better than other statistical frameworks. Additionally, machine learning can do this without observer bias. So um, it's a little easier to standardize from, for example, program to port program or um, field crews as they change throughout the years. Um, and you can produce these metrics that have been measured um, with some amount of standardization. And really, arguably, one of the best things about machine learning is that it can do all of these things really quickly. Um, so gone are the days of having to wade through all of your data um, to find these these variables and instead we can rapidly produce these estimates in a standardized fashion and we do see that machine learning has be become um, more useful in conservation um, so one of the most or the one of the most ubiquitous examples that we see is with species distribution modeling so again going back to the qrf capacity estimates that Richie was talking about, um, we see this commonly throughout the ecological world in general. There are also quite a few examples of audio recognition. Um, so particularly with birdsong and um, another example would be whale sonar. Um, so deriving specific characteristics of those calls as they relate to behavior which is another application that we see. So um, accelerometers have become much more common in wildlife tagging, and those data are starting to become um, more commonly analyzed with machine learning algorithms as well. And finally, what I will focus on next is going to be image recognition. Um, so Richie started to, to talk a little bit about how we have these very complex sites um, and pulling out or extracting those data that mean something to conservation is the next step in figuring out how to make this really efficient. So, um, there are quite a few examples of image recognition throughout the conservation literature. Um, these first ones that we see are the speciation from an image. So for example, bear or not bear. Um, or in the image on the right, it's taking um, images of footprints or tracks and speciating those. So I think this one is a, is a rhino. Then we also see the use of machine learning to identify individuals. So this image on the bottom left is a database called Global Finprint, um, and it's identifying specific individual sharks from imagery. Um, on the right is the manta matcher. Uh, it's a very similar idea where manta rays have 
unique spot patterns on their bellies. So the, this algorithm can be used to identify down to the individual. And what's great about these two approaches as well is that these are largely citizen science based. So um, tourists or local dive communities can go submit their photos to these databases and we can really increase our wealth of knowledge about these movement there about the movement of these animals with limited field or additional field sampling. And another application um, that I have seen start to come about is the addition of onboard processing to drones. So in this example, um, a drone is outfitted with a an algorithm that can identify elephants and it can also identify humans. And what it will do is alert the ranger station if humans are identified in close proximity to elephants in this region in order to prevent poaching. So I think that these are pretty indicative or they provide a nice example as to why or how machine learning can be really effective in conservation. But similar to drones, we see a pretty big barrier to entry for broad adoption. And I think that it's not a matter of if, but when. So we're just trying to figure out how to build these tools to make um, remote sensing and machine learning accessible in a, in a bigger way. So one of the, the biggest issues um, would be data management. So the amount of data that you need to train a machine learning algorithm can be a lot. Um, storing all of those data and writing those data can be a big challenge as well. Um, and then also just standardizing the data that you collect and managing your metadata can be um, something that we don't always do well and that there's no real standardized effort towards quite yet. One of the more interesting reasons that I saw um, in some of the literature about um, machine learning is that researchers see this algorithm as sort of a black box of voodoo, voodoo magic was the quote that I saw. So as researchers, we inherently like to understand how our analyses are working. Um, and by not fully seeing everything through every step of the machine learning algorithm can be one of those um, barriers to its adoption. We also know that annotating um, training data sets can be quite cumbersome. So there are ways to get around that. Um, I think the Google CAPTCHA program has done a really great job of this. Um, pretty much every time you are asked to prove you aren't a robot, you are actually training a machine learning algorithm for self-driving cars. So for th this example, it would be um, showing what images are traffic lights. And we've actually seen some groups do this. Um, I've seen it in CT scan imagery, um, as well as some uh, turtle identification imagery. So this is starting to happen, this crowdsourcing in the conservation community as well. The final barrier that I've heard discussed widely is a bottleneck of algorithms. Um, and that is starting to be solved by a group called Wildbook. So Wildbook is a consortium of organizations. It's funded largely by Microsoft, um, who started to develop AI for all of these different organizations. So now um, we're starting to see a broader availability of this type of uh, machine learning work for these specific arenas. And um, having them all in one place and open source, I think is a great step forward in overcoming that lack of algorithm for researchers. So we just talked a lot about um, how machine learning is being used specifically in the identification of animals from imagery. Um, and I think arguably that could be considered potentially low hanging fruit because animals look similar, they have repeatable patterns um, and they're much easier to pull out of an image despite how complex the habitat is in that image. But then when we think of habitat, there are so many different features and so many different landscapes um, and the amount of data that you can extract, habitat data especially, is sort of limitless. So 
um, it's been a little bit more of a challenge to figure out how to create a standardized effort towards habitat data collection from imagery. And Richie already talked about this, so I won't go into detail, but um, we have done this with a random forest pixel classifier where the intensity of the pixels are used to categorize it into these four main categories. And we've seen that work relatively well, especially when we think about this example with wood. So already, um, this is much faster than, for example, tracing the outline of every piece of wood in this uh, scenario. And then the inclusion of multi-spec imaging, as Richie pointed out as well, has also um, increase the differentiation or added, it's basically doubled the amount of data that we have to work with in these uh, machine learning algorithms. So um, what we are doing now is improving our image processing step. So as the drone is moving, all six of those sensors, or I'm sorry, those shutters are firing at a different time. So the image is not um, spatially and temporally rectified. So we use common tie points in order to align that image and then run it through a contrast limited adaptive histogram equalization in order to produce an image that has um, distinct, um, distinct boundaries between the areas that we're looking for. And something that we found is that even though this may not look pleasing to our eye, that doesn't really matter for the image or for the computer. So um, having high contrast between these areas is really important for the algorithm. And then we've started to move from pixel-based classification into object-based classification. And what this does is just take into context the can um, or take context into consideration. So instead of just the intensity of the pixels, now we're starting to look at the arrangement of those pixels and what they would mean logically. And at first glance, um, this has done a pretty good job. So here are two um, sites where we've used object-based classification in order to identify woody debris, as you see outlined um, in some of these boxes, as well as the river. So at first glance, this is doing pretty well. We're getting, I don't know, maybe 80% of the river here. Um, and we expect this to only improve um, as we continue to train the data sets, which is what we are doing right now. So um, a lot of annotating pieces of wood in our, in our imagery. And I just wanted to talk about another application that we're using with object-based detection within the confines of a regional convolutional neural network, and that is tracking marine megafauna um, on the Southeast Florida coast. So, as Mitch was saying, I'm actually formerly a marine biologist, so I worked primarily with these critters um, for the bulk of my career. And in, along South Florida, we've been able to find or define a new nursery for manta rays. Um, and these flights are being used to look at the interaction of mantas with other species, like you can see in this box. So the yellow box is tracking the manta, and the blue box is actually tracking a black tip shark. Um, but we can also use it to evaluate how often mantas are at risk of anthropogenic influence. So mantas often become entangled in fishing line um, or they have direct interactions with fishermen off of the piers. For whatever reason, they really like to hang out in inlets. So they are commonly being struck by boats. Um, so by developing this algorithm, we can more rapidly assess um, certain areas and we can use those strategies to think about um, closures or um, adaptive management of the opening of these fishing piers. Hey, Sarah, this is Amy. Yeah. We've got about five minutes okay, thanks. to wrap up. And actually, um, if you will send that link into the chat, um, this is another application that we're looking at. So this is a um, uh, an aerial image of a black tip shark migration in South Florida. Um, let's see, did that chat go out? Sorry, I'm having issues. Let's see. It, yep. The, so yeah, there's a link to Sarah's question in the chat. Excellent. So um, if you could see or guess how many sharks are in this footage, you can imagine it would take you a bit of a of an effort to count them all. 
Um, and maybe to give you some context, this is probably like a quarter mile of what is a 50 mile survey stretch. Um, and when I was in grad school, some poor undergrad had to sit in the lab for, I think it was like two years to count all of these sharks in this image. So being able to do that automatically, I'm sure would make her life a lot better. All right, I'm just gonna close it down and see how many people got it. Oh, pretty good. So yes, 716 sharks in this image. Um, and these are a commercially and ecologically important species for the area. Um, they are very close into shore. They interact with humans pretty frequently. So again, being able to do this more rapidly and automate the detection of these mass migrations that they, as they come through um, would be really beneficial from an economic and ecologic standpoint. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about species distribution modeling and image recognition and how we've used machine learning in that context. And I just wanna to touch briefly on how we are using it in animal behavior as well. Um, so biologging is um, a technique used in the wildlife industry to get information from critters in the wild. Um, and it started in, with marine mammals really because they will bring the tags right back to you but it's since evolved into biotelemetry. So the first ever satellite tag came about in 1984 where that um, data could be telemetered. And now um, there's really a global um, repository of this movement information. We have a pretty good understanding of where these species are moving, but we still don't really know what these animals are doing at those locations. And that has really started to be tackled through accelerometer data. So an accelerometer is just a sensor that measures your motion in three axes. Um, and from that, we can determine a specific behavior. So for example, when you pick up your iPhone and it lights up, some onboard processing algorithm has determined from an accelerometer in your phone that you are picking up your phone and you want it to light up. And we can use that same sort of logic um, in application to animal science. So we see that um, in, in first sort of blush, these accelerometers were tested actually in hydropower facilities to mimic what animals were experiencing when they were passing through hydropower. We've since seen inference of behaviors. So for example, um, we know that tiger sharks bounce dive um, when they are foraging. So we could identify areas of foraging hotspots based on their bounce diving activities. Um, since then, researchers have been able to validate nurse shark um, mating areas. Um, and we even see the development of daily activity budgets um, through the use of accelerometer tags. So machine learning in this context is really useful because the volume of data you get from an accelerometer tag is very large. Um, you're measuring three measurements just in motion alone, sometimes nine if you consider rotational and um, magnetic data as well, um, and then sampling anywhere from 30 to 150 times a second. So um, the ability to tackle all of that data relatively rapidly is really important on these tags. And then just to sum up, um, this ability to think about individual behavior in the context of what's happening in the example of a river in one channel unit um, and really thinking about how these animals are interacting with their environment and then pairing that with all of the broad scale work um, that we can do now as well uh, with drones and um, in this example watershed level sampling we start to have a more holistic understanding of um, what management steps we can take in order to preserve or improve these um, population levels. With that, I am happy to take any questions if there is time. Yes, we definitely have time. Um, so yeah, are there any questions out there specifically for Sarah? We've got about five minutes for questions for Sarah, and then we, we have time to open it up for additional questions after that. So once again, yeah, either raise your hand or throw your question in the chat. And 
I see a question in the chat, so we'll start there. Uh, the question is, how accurate is the machine learning count of large wood compared to an on-the-ground measurement? That's a good question, and that's something that we are still working on validating. So right now, we're still trying to get the object-based detection to recognize all of the wood. But fortunately, like Richie was pointing to, we do have all of those ground truth data um, from CHAMP and then also as we continue forward with DASH. So that is certainly a metric that we will be comparing. Uh, we just haven't gotten there. Okay. And another question from the chat, uh, what software are you using for object-based classification? And is it relatively affordable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we're doing everything in Python, which is free. Um, and there are quite a few organizations that are open sourcing their, most of it is Python within the confines of like a TensorFlow or Keras package, um, which are all free. Um, and so there are some great websites out there like wildbook.org is a really good one where you can go check out open sourced uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, and then all of ours will eventually be, is, is being developed open source as well. All right. Um, any other questions out there for Sarah? All right, uh, Mitch, I see you've got a question. Yeah, Sarah, I was wondering with the uh, ability to instantaneously, or I might be not quite on board with instantaneously, but fairly quickly, uh, do a rapid count on uh, a group of um, animals, uh, say a school of par in a pool. Are you able to uh, identify those par and track them? And when I say identify, would it be possible in the future or now to identify the difference between, say, steelhead and spring chinook? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's actually work that's happening right now. So I know that there is infrastructure um, that gets put into rivers, um, for example, the Baki River Watcher, and that's something that we're working on right now is to do speciation, and I think it's entirely plausible um, and likely that that will happen. And then um, maybe even down to the individual level. So for example, in sea turtles, I know that there is a pretty high um, level of success for tracking individual sea turtles with facial recognition software based on the morphology of their face scoots. Um, and so I think that if we were able to look at really specific morphological features of the animal, um, and if we had enough training data, I think that it's entirely plausible that both of those are, are feasible. All right, thanks. That was a great presentation from both of you. Um, I think we, we've got time to go ahead and open it up for questions for either Sarah or Richie at this point. Um, so again, you can raise your hand or you can throw them in the chat. All right, I see Phil, you've got your hand up. Want to ask a question? Yeah, I do. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, okay, uh, thanks. Um, thanks both of you for the great presentations. Um, I had a, a question for Richie. Uh, Richie, for the, it wasn't clear to me which um, sort of habitat features you were able to distinguish with the drone imagery. I mean, I saw your maps and they they look like you were delineating some side channels, but I was I was trying to understand if you were um, able to classify habitat units or, or if you could kind of give us some examples of what you're getting from the drone imagery versus the, the, um, uh, the habitat surveys. Yeah, that's a good question. So initially we had hoped that we could pull, you know, channel unit distributions from the drone imagery, uh, but we ran into a lot of problems with canopy cover, overhanging vegetation, things like that. And because of the fact that we are laying out channel units for our fish crew, we actually go out and we're still delineating uh, morphological units with a submeter GNSS receiver. Um, and that, you know, that's allowed us to capture a lot of those really subtle 
types of channel units um, and also the you know the small side channels that are completely covered with vegetation we're able to mark the tops and bottoms of those but um, you know there is there are some really nice tools out there like the gut toolkit which I know you're familiar with um, that can automatically pull channel units out of LIDAR data so I know there's you know there's promise in doing that but I think just for us we ran into so many limitations physically with trying to pull channel units out and because we're sampling in such diverse habitats that um, it just made more sense for the time being to physically lay those out with a sub meter GPS but I could imagine in the future you know you could definitely train a machine to find things like pools and riffles uh, if the drone can see them. Yeah perfect thank you yeah that, that that's kind of consistent with what we've um, come across so but uh, yeah that that's great thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for the question. All right, and then we've got another question from the chat, and this is um, to both of you. Uh, is the additional multispectral information from something like a Micasense Ultim worth the trade-off in RGB image quality compared to a dedicated RGB camera? That's a good question. That's something that we talk about a lot. Um, there is the, the imagery that we get from the DJI Phantom that we fly is substantially clearer, um, but it's you do lose that added layer of differentiation. So for example, differentiating between the water um, and the vegetation. Um, but I also think it's really based on your application. So I think that we are leaning in the riverine sampling world towards the addition of those extra bands really helping with being able to differentiate the water out from everything else. But for example, if you're more interested in sam or surveying animals or something, we have a project that we are hopefully going to do um, sampling sea turtles, which are relatively endothermic, um, where we would also be more exampled in more interested in using that multi-spec imaging. But for something else where you really need that high resolution pixel density, then maybe the RGB is better for those purposes. Yeah, I think for us, like Sarah said, we're still trying to kind of figure that out. Uh, initially with the pixel based classification scheme, the additional bands helped out significantly. But what we're finding with sort of this object based deep learning infrastructure, the additional bands don't necessarily help with um, detecting objects and there's actually support in the literature for that as well so in a perfect world we would really like to have both and i know that there are some drone packages out there where you can fly a high resolution rgb camera and a multi-spectral camera so um, that's just one that we haven't quite haven't quite got the answer to yet all right great um and uh, a question from, is that Sean Welch? Yeah, can you hear me OK, Amy? Can hear you. Yeah, I think Richie actually just answered my question because when he was talking about some of the vegetative effects and trying to resolve some of those canopy issues after the structure for motion processing, you know, why not take a paired approach on your ship and have both sensors so you could actually use the multi-spec to you know, identify those wet features and then help that kind of resolve some of those issues that you'd have on your SFM surface. So it sounds like you're kind of going to maybe move from the DJI platform to something where you could have those sensors. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, in a perfect world with unlimited funding, we'd love to do that. Um, moving forward, it'll probably be something like we fly the multi-spectral camera and then fly the Phantom 4 and then uh, utilize uh, some of the common point common points within those images to automatically align all the bands to get to another six band imagery where image where you're just replacing those Altum RGB images with the Phantom. Um, but you know, those are just some of the ideas we've been throwing around, but definitely would like to stick with the infrared bands. And I could imagine in the future, those uh, multi multi spec cameras, you know, getting to the same resolution as a as a 20, mix, 20 megapixel CMOS sensor. So um, right now it doesn't really make sense to throw out those additional bands at the moment um, because I do see that technology improving in the future. All right. Any, I think we have time for another question, but I'm not, I don't see any hands raised at the moment. 
Um, maybe I'll, I can look back. I saw a couple in the chat that we have. Yeah, I was, yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I was just going to address, 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 address Russell's question. Uh, that's a great one. I mean, where this is really a forum where um, we should start coming together to decide where we do want to start documenting protocols and methods. And I think there is a huge need for um, folks in the Columbia Basin to come up with a document to start sort of um, developing standards for drone imagery collection. You know, we have some of our internal standards that we've come up with, but that by no means is a, a, a polished and finished document that everyone else needs to adhere to. I think that um, that's just sort of a big need right now because this type of work is in its infancy and we haven't seen a, a large adoption across the basin. Um, you know, those are some of the questions that we need to answer as a group um, to sort of come up with a, a, a repository and a place to document these types of things. All right, and we've got, I think, one more um, that just came in um, from David Hines. Have you tried the machine learning functionality in ArcGIS Pro? No, we have not. Our, uh, we were really trying to get away from Esri products, no offense to Esri, uh, but we're really trying to move towards an open source uh, GIS platform. We don't particularly want to be reliant on Esri products. Um, but I have heard a lot of good things about that, and I do know it works fairly well. Uh, but really for us, the motivation was more uh, working in open source and trying to come up with an approach that can be adopted more widely without being reliant on um, some type of cost-based structure. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, uh, both everyone participating today and um, also a big thanks to our speakers, Richie Carmichael and Sarah Hoffman. Those were excellent presentations from both of you. Uh, and before we leave, I'm gonna, I've got just a couple things to share with you before we wrap up. So hopefully you are seeing my screen now. Um, let's see, oh, before I get to next, the next webinar, I just wanted to remind people we did record today's webinar. So you could watch it again, or if you know someone who might be interested, you can share it with them. Um, the video is going to be posted on TNAMP's YouTube channel, and it will also be linked on the ETIS, the Emerging Technologies Information Sessions landing page. Uh, I'll share that link in a second. Uh, the next webinar in the series is next Tuesday, October 13th at 1 p.m. Uh, we'll hear from Kane Kuntz from the U.S. Forest Service and Lauren Burns from the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, uh, both of them talking about using drones to assist with stream habitat assessment. Uh, looking a little further out, this is the general schedule for the entire series uh, and the link to the ETI's landing page where you can find the latest information. And as I mentioned a minute ago, we'll link to today's webinar. Um, share it on that uh, website as well. Um, and I guess the last thing I wanted to mention is that we are planning an emerging tech multi-day face-to-face event for late 2021 or early 2022, assuming it's safe to do so from a public health standpoint. Um, and so at the end of the aerial monitoring sessions, uh, we'll be sharing a questionnaire to get your input uh, to help us shape both the content and the format of that face-to-face -face event. So if today's presentations had you thinking you really wanted to know something more about a particular topic or it spurred an idea that you think we should follow up on, we would love to hear that from you. Um, so keep an eye out for that questionnaire that we'll be sharing the last week of October. So thanks for sticking around to the very end and have a great day, everyone.